Welcome to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a digital support group for everyone interested in a learning lifestyle. I'm your host, Holly. I'm your co-host, Melody. Today we're going to be talking about the various types of curriculum because that's all everybody's talking about on uh, all the lists I've been seeing. But I want to know what you've been doing. Oh, I've been getting ready to teach some classes to oh. middle schoolers, which oh. is a great age. Oh, yes. They're they're all over the place. And uh, <laughs> lots of planning. It's like, oh, a little bit of review of general science and middle school math and how to plan a lesson so it makes sense to kids. Oh, well, yeah. So I'm having fun. That's it's a good review. How, how many, about you? Yeah. How many kids are you working with? Uh, well, a total of nine in one class. The classes are small because of everything going on oh, in sure. the world. Oh, sure. Sure, yeah. So, nine kiddos. But that's, you know. That's good. That's like going back in when I was working with my home, my family, because there oh, were right. seven kids. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's. But they were all doing different things. Sure. But it's going to be a fun year. Fun. Well, we started school on Monday. Um, mm-hmm. So, we just finished our first week of second grade, and... We got everything done every oh, day, man. so I feel like a gold star should be put on my chart. Yes, <laughs> especially if you got all your plans, if your plans matched your reality. That's right, always fun. Right, and, and I do Charlotte Mason uh, method of education, so we have a large variety of topics, mm-hmm. but our lessons are short. And of course, we're going to be talking about the various types of curriculum uh, today, so I think we'll just go ahead and get into it. There are how many major types would you say, Melody? Well, I think we could say five major five. types. Okay. Uh, there, we could probably subdivide some of that. But basically, you've got a traditional approach that everyone's familiar with, and then Charlotte Mason, like mm-hmm. you mentioned. Unit Which people study. would consider a living book approach. Yes. Right. Because I'm mm-hmm. sure people are seeing that terminology just as much. Right. And then some unit study options, which are similar to Charlotte Mason in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, classical education options and unschooling. Unschooling, yep. Which unschooling isn't really a curriculum, um, but it is a schooling choice. So right. maybe, you know, we're talking curriculum slash schooling choice I think so. in this uh, in this discussion Just today. Approaches to learning. Right. Exactly. I like that. I like that term, approaches to learning. So why don't we start with traditional and talk about what makes um, an approach a traditional approach? I think I would say that's what we're all familiar with if we went to a government school mm-hmm. back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, your textbooks, read the chapter, answer the questions, take the test, um, that basic, basic textbook approach or workbooks and work texts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so it's not real in-depth studies. Not always. Not well, always. I don't know. I mean, it can be, it but, be. but sometimes I, I think when I know when I used a textbook approach, when I used a Becca, I never felt like we really delved deeply into a subject. Because we were learning things, and then we were taking a test, and we were learning things, and that to me that's not that doesn't offer that in depth learning. If you're sticking to that scope and sequence, if they you're put trying you on. to finish the book by the end of the year, you you feel pressure to right. keep up the pace. Right. It can be, and we've used textbooks as a reference, like mm-hmm. with our encyclopedias, to look into things and learn more about things. Because some of those textbooks are really colorful they've Mm -hmm. got great pictures oh they do have great pictures and they've if you're using one that's the same you know grade level that your child is they've already fit it this is the amount of information for that age child well that's true I, i probably am guilty of trying to add a little too many layers to it so maybe I, I want to go too far into the depths with my with my well, studies but that's a different that's a little more leisurely approach mm-hmm. if you have the freedom to stroll through learning and maybe not be on a schedule textbooks work really well for some people i have friends who've used for example a becca online mm-hmm. for all of their children for yep. a couple of decades and mm-hmm. love it because Everything is planned. They do it and they move on. They they have other things that they're doing, and the mom didn't want to have to spend the time to figure it out. Or I have people who are friends who. Um, oh well, if you're working, think. if you have a really busy lifestyle, or you have to work, either work from home or work outside of the home, something that's completely laid out, and all you do is open the book, and that's the thing you do that day is perfect. Right. Yeah. And um. 
I have friends who have a lot of outside volunteer activities, so mm-hmm. they can they can easily check off that learning box. They've done their work for the day, and then they go on and right. do a lot of other things. Right, and that that may be where you know even more in depth learning is happening when they're doing their other activities. Probably right. Yeah. So okay, so that's our traditional school at home. Um, do we want to talk about what what companies have those materials? Real quickly, like just briefly mention who might be someone, if you're looking for that that kind of an approach where you could buy those products. I think so. That okay. would be a good idea. Um, one of the one of the companies that's been around a long time is Abeka. Mm-hmm. And they supply a lot of uh, private schools with their curriculum. They do. So their materials are not really written with the understanding that you're a homeschooler, but they do sell their materials to homeschoolers. Right. And the thing to know, if you're choosing a traditional curriculum like that, that was designed for a classroom, is that you're going to have more activities or more pages of the workbooks or more review than you might need. Yes, I learned that. Um, And and eventually, that was too much for me, and we went to um, another one of the ones we'll be talking about, which is unit studies. So you're right. It's it's important to realize that there is some busy work built right. into textbook approach That's that you may not need for your homeschool students. Right. But if you come across a concept and your child needs more practice, do it all. Right. And if they catch it the first time around, move on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's one. What's another one? Uh, well, you know, there's um, Calvert School, right. which I believe Calvert, if you actually enroll online with them, they are an accredited school and their credits would transfer Right, because they're a school. Right. Mm -hmm. So for people who might want to be putting their kids back into public school, uh, I just saw a lot of discussion on some homeschoolist people wanting to put kids back into public school and being very unhappy to be told the school doesn't have to accept your credits for your high school students. So Calvert School, being that when you enroll online, it's an accredited school, may be a really good fit for some people. And then there are, um, oh, you were saying workbook approach. That would be like the life packs that Alpha Omega has out. Right. Right. Life packs, uh, Christian Light Publications has work texts, I think. They, I think they have some. And some textbooks. Mm -hmm. And some textbooks. Yeah. So that's, that's just kind of a good cursory glance at traditional. Um, what should we talk about next? Why don't you talk about Charlotte Mason since that's what you... It is my... uh, Yes, Charlotte Mason is what made our homeschool um, what I would consider a happy homeschool. So we had started with a Becca Mm -hmm. and too many pages um, after a few years of that. And it was a very thorough, very um, well-rounded curriculum. And and I liked a lot about it, but I was like, oh, no, I have five kids. I'm going to drown in this paperwork. Mm -hmm. So we went to unit studies for a few years, and that was really fun. But it was not as in-depth, although unit studies can be in-depth. I was buying some that were already prepared, and I liked them. There was a company, oh, back in the day called Helping Hand, and they had these uh, unit studies. They were fabulous. But I still wanted something more, and then I met Charlotte Mason. Uh And that, um, being that I really am um, a voracious reader, and I love history, um, it was a great fit for us. And that's... uh, what would be called the living book approach. So Charlotte Mason, you would not find textbooks generally. Generally, what, but there are people starting to write curriculum. Yes, that's Charlotte Mason somewhat style. amusing to me. <laughs> um, so Charlotte Mason, one of the hallmarks of that approach is that you use a real book that was written by someone who had a passion mm-hmm. for a topic. So for example, this year in our homeschool for second grade, we are, our science, uh, one of our books for science is a book called, um, I think it's called A Single Drop of Water. And we are reading about water and the, the uh, properties of water. And then there are going to be a series of small experiments we're going to do. And Charlotte Mason method um, says to do short lessons. Right. So we read a single page in the book. We looked at these beautiful, beautiful photographs. We talked a little bit about it and then we moved on. Right. And the you know, day after day, those short lessons they do. build on each other and they're short and kiddos can remember. And it's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect for young kids who have no attention span at all when you're only asking them to sit down and pay attention for maybe up to 20 minutes. And then we moved on to reptiles. 
And we read about reptiles from the um, Book of Nature Study by Anna Comstock. That's probably not the actual title of it. But anyway, we read we read about reptiles and then we watched a video. Um, my son wanted to see a snake swallowing an egg or something. <laughs> anyway, but we, we got a lot of topics in because our lessons are short. Yes. And the books we read are really interesting books. They're not, uh, you know, some dry thing that someone was assigned to write mm-hmm. as part of a encyclopedia or a textbook and so for us that's been a great fit and it's multi-sensory so if you have wiggly kids um, they do great with that and if you have really studious kids competent carls they do great with that it it was a good fit for all of my kids so um, I'm just singing its praises but there's um, there are different resources for Charlotte Mason options the one I have used for many years is Ambleside Online, mm-hmm. which uh, is a fantastic resource that these wonderful women put together. And there's no cost to to access their curriculum selections. There There is a cost to buy books. Many right. books you could borrow from your library. Um, you could even maybe, um, what is that when you get books online, like Overdrive or something? Right. Right. Some of them you can do that. A lot of them are Gutenberg texts or things that you can find free on the internet. Mm-hmm. But some of the books are so wonderful. You're going to want to buy them. You want them. to buy them and build your own library. Yeah, yeah. And I have a I have a rather large bookcase mm-hmm. full of books that I've collected over the years of doing Charlotte Mason, which made it nice when we started homeschooling again uh, with this little After guy because yes. I've added some new things, but I had a lot already on hand. Well, I think that really talks to those books being living books that you want to keep because you kept them. Yeah, I don't want to get rid of them. Even though you I weren't actively them. homeschooling mm-hmm. for a few years. Yeah, I love them myself. So that uh, Ampleside Online is the one with which I'm the most familiar. What are some other ones that you um, that you know about? Well, uh, most people are familiar with Sunlight. Oh, yes. Sunlight. Or Winter Promise. I've heard a lot about those. And Five in a Row for those early... Oh, yes, that's a lovely curriculum, and I can see, yeah, that's perfectly a living books approach. Mm -hmm. For those Mm -hmm. young ones, because your whole whole curriculum is centered on a living book. Right. A really great book that you don't want to miss. Those are some great, great books. Um, It's pretty easy to find. You can just Google living books approach or Charlotte Mason approach. I'm trying to think. Simply Charlotte Mason is another online Mm -hmm. resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are live uh, a pretty good library of books that were written by various people about Charlotte Mason and the Charlotte Mason method. Educating the Wholehearted Child by right. Sally Clarkson. Sally is Clarkson favorite. was really big for a long time mm-hmm. and I know she's still out there so maybe some some folks coming up might want to look I into her know. resources. But that book is a good overview. That's it not is. a curriculum. That's just a good introduction to this is what we're talking about. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then there's the um, the original homeschooling series that was written by Miss Charlotte Mason herself. That's right. And when you start reading that, it's going to take your brain a little while to click over because <laughs> she was she did live in the 1800s in England, but that woman had so much wisdom just about training children in good habits. Mm-hmm. And then when you read that, you realize you have to train yourself in good habits. So um, the first student in your homeschool is usually you yourself. That's right. Um, I was surprised to find that out, but I'm hoping that I've been a good student. Good students, yeah. We all learn that way. The, the, one of the ways I sum up Charlotte Mason is short lessons for short people. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm still well, a short say. person. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, even in but high you know. school, it, you still want to keep the lessons short. Yes. Because everyone gets tired of something if they're just staring at it and messing with it for a long time and you, you get frustrated mm-hmm. and especially mm-hmm. some of those harder subjects um you get I, brain fatigue you do exactly that's a perfect term for it okay so that was charlotte mason maybe not in a nutshell so much but um sorry i just love it so much so now let's talk about unit studies we homeschooled with unit studies i had i came to homeschooling from a background and as a kindergarten teacher and i had taught with unit studies in the classroom. That's so interesting. It was so much fun. Yeah. And um, so I was familiar with that. And when I was looking at curriculum at the first homeschool book fair that I went to, Mm -hmm. of course, that really resonated with me because at the time I had a newborn and a five-year-old and a three-year-old. So I didn't want to have, I didn't want to have to learn a whole new way of doing something. And I was familiar with that. But 
we loved it and we continued with unit studies for the whole 30 some odd years did that you? we in school wow we sure did now, it worked for us okay well i I want to know more about doing unit studies with high school students, but um, that's not the topic here. So uh, <laughs> we might have day. to we might have to talk about that another point. So, uh, what are some unit studies that um, which one did you use? We used Konos. Oh, Konos! I remember because that about was Konos. a long time ago. It intimidated me. <laughs> there weren't very I was, many out there. I was scared to death of Konos. Oh my goodness! Because it had too many things to prepare Lots to do. <laughs> but of course, I looked at that and it, I was so excited. Um, I kind of did my own thing with it, which Mm -hmm. may or may not be, I don't guess there's a right way to do it, but I also, we taught in a sort of Charlotte Mason manner because Mm -hmm. I would build our unit of study around a living book. Mm -hmm. My planning trips would start off with a trip to the library, see what books were out there, find the ones that were really great, and then build a unit of study off of that. And so I used all the suggestions in the Konos manual, which Mm -hmm. was gigantic. I remember seeing that. Um, That's why I was scared. (laughs) (laughs) And picked out the ones that would work for us. Mm -hmm. And, of course, at the time, I was really only educating the kindergartner. Sure. But the three-year-old was right there with us. Right. And we did short lessons because Mm -hmm. that was, I already knew that was what would work. Right. And, um... Then we did a lot of activities, hands-on activities, and well, I had a the really wiggly person, learning. and mm-hmm. so I knew that was going to be a good fit. Mm-hmm. So we just kept on going with that. There were some years where I just wrote my own unit studies based on something that the family was interested in. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Go to the library, find all the books, do all the things we could think of learning about, say, for example, wildflowers. We wanted to know. Oh, all the wildflowers of well, Texas. Well, we are in Lady Bird Johnson country here in Texas, mm-hmm. so you have so to study we wildflowers learned here. them all, collected them, all that stuff, and um, that was the unit of study for a, a month or so. Uh-huh. But there are so When I started, there weren't very many unit studies right, out there. Right, That was a long time ago. Now there are a lot of things that you can look at, and some popular ones that I'm familiar with are things like My Father's World. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tapestry of Grace, even Trail Guide to Learning, that whole geography unit study. I had not heard of that. That sounds oh, really so interesting. Fun. We studied the United States with that one year. Oh, wow. And there's one for the world geography. And then you can find, um, I think, Where the Brook and River Meet. That's an Aunt Green, Anne of Green Gables based on oh, that Oh, a unit study book. based on that. Yes. Wow. So you can find unit studies well, based on a book. I think there's one based on the Little House on the Prairie books. Mm, yeah, the when we did unit studies, they, ours were based on a book. Like one, I think one was based on the best Christmas pageant ever. Oh, and that's a fun book. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. We did we only did unit studies for a few years. Like I said, it was by a company called Helping Hand, which I don't think is out there anymore. But what I liked about it was it combined all the best parts of traditional, where everything was all ready for you. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. But it was a unit study. And so yes. my kids created their own like little notebooks and they had really mm-hmm. interesting uh, activities for science and stuff. And whatever came up in the book. I think we, we also read um, The Witch of Blackbird Pond. Oh, yeah. One of the unit studies was based around that. So it was really, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But I, being a person who needed some help still, loved that it was already laid out oh, for me. Yeah. And that, I guess we like should I said, mention. that Kono's thing was just, well, I just I, couldn't do it. We ought to just mention what is a unit study. Oh, yeah, and that's That true. idea is that you're taking from your topic of study, you're pulling out your history and your science, and you would do your writing about that topic. Right. Mm-hmm. Some people pull out the spelling words from their topic. Mm-hmm. I didn't, but some people do. Um, your read alouds are about your topic, so everything you're learning is coming out of your right, unit of right. study. Mm-hmm. And maybe even in the younger grades, you could use that with math and science. You can. Mm-hmm. Some units, but you're going to need some textbooks, and I'm sure you did use some we textbooks, use textbooks for math. For math. Mm-hmm. Because it's all laid out. You pick right. up your book. You do all your lessons. When you finish, you're done. Right. Unless you're <laughs> a mathematician. On. Who wants to do that on their own? Yeah. So, yeah, unit studies are great for, um, they're just really good. And, well, you know, we can explore more about that topic. So, um, after unit studies, then we have a classical approach. And classical approach is really serious studying to me. Like when I think about classical, I'm like, oh, they're doing all that hard, serious stuff. <laughs> um, they, they're studying Latin from a young age. They they're are. studying um, memorizing a lot of stuff. 
right? Mm -hmm. Generally, it's a chronological approach to history, Mm -hmm. and science is woven into history in that way. Right. And it's based on how people learn at different ages. Right. Right. Different stages. So is it it's a Greek model? Is that Greek? The um because it's like the the logic stage and the rhetoric stage and the I can't remember the other. There's three stages. See, because y'all can tell, I didn't do classical <laughs> education. I only heard about it. But it's based on that at certain ages, kids are prepared for, are able to do certain things. So in the youngest age, which I can't remember what it is now, they can memorize a lot of stuff. Um, so the idea is that they just like cram lots of facts. They memorize states and capitals. Oh, they're and like little sponges. Presidents. Yeah, they because kids naturally remember. Like So the other day... I said to my son, um, we were studying something, and I said, do you remember how, um, oh, I can't remember what it is, but I said, do you remember how that was? We read this book last year, and he said, no, I don't remember. And I said, but you can tell me everything about Minecraft? Oh, yeah. Oh, like you can remember. You just didn't want to remember that fact, apparently. But in uh, in classical education, they do a lot of memorization in the early grades. Mm-hmm. And then when they get to the middle grades, then they're supposed to be able to take that information and apply it. Right. And then in the upper grades is when they like to argue with you anyway. And then they're supposed to be prepared to debate and and defend positions. So there's a lot of information that is poured into the kids. Right. Yeah. And there are some good curriculum out there and some good communities using that. Mm -hmm. Classical Conversations is one. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been seeing that they're enrolling here. They just started here in our area. They just started. Mm -hmm. uh, What are some curriculum um, so Memoria Press comes right, to mind, right. and they're, they have a lot of materials, a lot of workbooks and things. They have um, Latin and foreign language for kids from a young age, which is part of the classical uh, model is that kids learn Latin. Um, then Veritas Press. Of course, when you have the words Veritas and Memoria, that is just that kind of is a clue. Just kind of a clue. Um, and then uh, what else do we have? I have... I see you have here learning adventures. I've not heard of them. That sounds fun. Learning adventures. I'd like to know more about I that one. Um, this list that I'm using came off of a really nice graphic that I found in social okay. media, and mm-hmm. I have seen a lot of really good uh, lists of this is the curriculum. Here are the approaches, and I think it'd be a good idea to talk about how to find the one that fits you. Right. In a minute. Yeah. So then. Um, so then after classical, we would have unschooling, which, as we said, is not really a curriculum. It's a, it's a learning approach. Um, and some people have odd ideas about what that means. Can you tell us a little bit more about unschooling? unschooling. For, mm-hmm. us, uh, for us, it meant that was what we were doing in the summer when we were learning. And I wasn't planning the lessons necessarily, but we were following the kids' interests. And so if someone was all about rocks one year... Uh, then we just looked up all the things we could find about rocks and we went on a rock hunt. And so it's just a more part of a learning lifestyle approach to everything is a learning opportunity and it's not as, it's more student led. Right. Not the mom or the teacher planning out all the lessons. You're just following those interests. Um, we did that every summer. Learning kept going, Mm -hmm. but, um. That's, that was what we said. We unschool in the summer. But a lot of people unschool all the time, and that is their approach to learning. Right. And so if you are an unschooler, um, you can find some unschooling communities on social media that are really helpful for pointing you to um, opportunities in your area to mm-hmm. go and learn more things. Right. Sometimes it's helpful to have a handy checklist to see if you are hitting all the things. Kids don't know what they don't know, and so you don't want to leave any big holes in right. things like math, um, right. things like that that go more step by step. But I have friends who just do the most interesting things in mm-hmm. their own school. Yeah, I knew a woman who, I think she had like six or eight kids. She had a very large family and they unschooled. And uh, one of her kids, I guess when he was 13, he realized that he wanted to go to college. He finally, I guess he realized what he wanted to do and in a matter of just a few years, went through all of the math that was required in high school so that he had the math knowledge he needed to pass the um, entry exam for college. And and he did it all on his own. And this happened yeah. to with every one of her kids. And I remember thinking, that's astonishing. 
I, I really thought that my kids probably would just never do anything if I allowed them to unschool. But um, when people find what they want to do, they and have they motivation. And that's one of the hallmarks of unschooling is mm-hmm. that instead of, you know, leading the horse to water and making him drink, <laughs> you just have the water around. And when he's thirsty, <laughs> you know, so goes. unschooling, you would have a lot of great educational materials. And it, and it doesn't mean your kids are driving the bus, basically. It just means that you're creating a rich educational environment. Exactly. And so there's all the materials around and you're supporting them in mm-hmm. their learning. And most of the home, the unschooling families I know, the mom and dad or whoever are also engaged in learning all the time mm-hmm. also. It's like mm-hmm. the whole family is busy learning new things and interesting things all the time. Yes. Well, that was a good overview of the main curriculum types or approaches that are out there. When we come back, we'll delve a little more deeply into each type, talk about the pros and cons of it, and how to figure out what kind works for you. Good idea. Our podcast today is sponsored by Transcript Maker. It's an online service that allows you to create professional high school transcripts in the comfort of your own home. Yes, and you know what's really wonderful about that is that even if you're a Charlotte Mason homeschooler like I am and you don't really have um, books and and tests, you still have to translate that information into a transcript for your child. So Transcript Maker really made that so much easier for me. How did you, how did you translate those activities and those Study. Right. So for high school, because that's where you want a transcript, um, each year we studied English. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, freshman year was English one. Oh, and, right. you know, uh, so- sophomore year was English two and so on. Math. We did use math texts for, for that. We studied history. So when we were studying world history, that was world history. So it does translate. No matter what uh, curriculum approach you use, you can take what your children have been doing and you can turn it into a transcript. Right. Put it into the format that, mm-hmm. the, that a transcript generally is in. Right. Yes. Because when you're a homeschooler and you're trying to get your kids into college or to a trade school or whatever, you want to present a piece of paper that has that information in a concise manner that they're used to seeing. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're going to really have a hard time and you're going to make it hard for your kids. And don't forget the 14-day free trial. Yeah, just go to www.transcriptmaker.com. Transcript Maker. Simply better transcripts. All right, well, let's get back into our discussion of the curriculum uh, types or learning approaches. And let's talk about the pros and cons of each one. Okay. You want to start with the traditional textbook approach? Yeah, let's start with that one. So what would be a benefit or some benefits of using that approach? Oh, I think the benefits would be that it's all laid out and that if you're choosing a textbook on grade level, you're sure that you're covering everything that typically gets covered at that age or grade. That is a good point because I know that I was concerned and I see a lot of people saying, how do I know what my kid needs to know for second grade? Well, if you have a textbook approach, it's already done. It's already done. Mm -hmm. And then the another benefit is that they're very thorough generally um pretty complete not it doesn't leave you wondering you can you can have confidence in your textbook Mm -hmm. that's true they spend time um creating it and they've done the research and they've got all the information that should be covered right there for you right in theory yes in theory and and they have they also have very good teacher manuals so yes the teacher manual will tell you exactly what to do, what materials you need, and you can, uh, you don't have to do very much planning. You'll have no. to do a little planning, but you don't Most have to do very much. Most of them are pick up and go, mm-hmm. which is a benefit if you're new and you're not sure. Yeah, so, so they I did build feel, confidence. It, yes, I, that's why I was really thankful to use Abeka at the start of my homeschooling career, because it was very, I, I was able to take my worries on that part mm-hmm. out, because I knew I had a good curriculum that covered the bases, and I didn't have to worry that I was letting my student down. Exactly. Okay. What is a um, disadvantage of the traditional school at home textbook approach? I'd say a disadvantage could be that because it the format never changes. It's the same mm-hmm. every time. Sometimes you can get bored or just burn out because mm-hmm. it's always the same thing. Kids can just check out because 
here we go again, read the text, answer the questions, right? dump that info, right? go on to the next. Right. Um, there's ways around it. Sure. But um, that could be that could be one drawback. Can you think of another? Yes, I think that sometimes for the home educator, they become a little rigid because if it's not in that lesson plan, they don't want to allow time to get off mm-hmm. the lesson plan. So I think that there's that danger where they're like, but no, you know, there's an interesting bird outside. No, we have to do this right now. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it, it can, like you said, it, it can kind of just make people get into a little box and not really get out. A little bit of a run. Mm-hmm. Kind of box you in. There's also the danger that you think you've already, like, you've exhausted the topic because you've gotten to the end of that chapter. Right. But there might still be more to learn more about to it. Learn. Okay. Well, that that's some good things to consider. Let me take um, Charlotte Mason. Okay. So the advantages, I think, the pros to Charlotte Mason are that you will get to delve into a topic very deeply and you will have a wide body of information. Um, so, for example, in history, we start history with the history of England. And okay. a lot of, um, so in the textbook approach, a lot of times the history for the young children starts in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was a lot going on around the world and so um, yes. another thing we've studied is we've already learned about Marco Polo and Cathay and all this these things because it's a very wide encompassing approach so I think that's a real positive your child will be exposed to a lot more information um, that they typically would be at that age my son is seven and he's learned a lot of things already that many kids his oh, age I agree. haven't been taught then they start making connections Yes, and that's really, really exciting when that happens. However, um, a drawback is that some of the Charlotte Mason materials do not have very much prepared for the teacher. And okay. so that's why I like Ampleside Online, because these ladies have, have a lot prepared. But in some respects, Charlotte Mason can be kind of a unit study approach where it requires a lot of preparation for the home educator. And if you're not really familiar with what you need to cover, not having that all laid out can be kind of a downfall. Right, because you might feel like you don't know what you're supposed to do next. There's there's not a one guide fits all kind exactly. of thing. Exactly, and way. it's not, um, their levels aren't like grade levels. So for, especially for Ambleside Online, and, and I'm not familiar with some of the other Charlotte Mason materials, but it doesn't have like a grade. It's not like grade one, grade two. It's, um, the information is organized by years. And they suggest you start with year zero, which mm-hmm. would be, for most people, kindergarten. Right. So if your child's not a strong reader, you might have to pick a different year. And so there can be some ambiguity about it that might be hard for a new homeschooler to understand how to use that material. So, um, and, you know, some of them, Sunlight, I think, is grade level based and, and five in a row. Some of those curriculums that have come out now that are based around the living book approach are a little more in depth. You just... You may have a hard time figuring out where to put your child. Right. But I think there's more support for the teacher or the parent teacher. Right. Uh, a little bit more. There are more guidelines out now. There are. But but that can be a drawback for some people. Okay. So what about unit studies? I would say similar to Charlotte Mason because you are studying a wide variety of topics. Uh, another advantage would be that you can go deeply into a mm-hmm. topic if you want to, and you can spend as much or as little time on something as you want to. I heard one lady talking about how they spent an entire year studying trains, but they incorporated geography in that study and history oh, sure. and the science of the tra- and the whole thing. But they, and I was new at that time, couldn't imagine how you would spend an entire right. year on trains. Yeah, that does sound a little bit very successful. Yeah. They covered they covered a lot of information, so that's one advantage. You can really delve deeply into a, a topic, and because most unit studies are very hands on and interactive, kids remember. It keeps their interest. Keeps high. their interest. Things that you jump in and do, you're more likely to remember. True. True. So very interactive, and um, those are a couple of advantages. But I guess that one drawback might be more planning required of the teacher mm-hmm. and more running around to gather materials or find your books or right. figure out what you're going to do. And then uh, you may not feel like you've really uh, covered your subjects, or you might not be sure that how to track those right, subject right. areas. Sure. Um, so some similarities to Charlotte Mason. 
Um, there are ways around those drawbacks. You just, like you said earlier, if that's what you're studying, when you finish that unit of study, was it science? Was it history? Um, mark it down in your book like mm-hmm. that. Those are a couple. Uh, what would you say about classical? Well, a pro is that it's very thorough. It's very that's thorough. That's true. And also, I do like their emphasis on bringing in foreign language studies um, for Early younger on. students. Mm-hmm. I really believe strongly in that. Um, I started studying French in fourth grade, and it was a real benefit to me. That That's a time when kids can really learn things. So the younger to bring in language, yes. the better. So, um, yeah, those are the things I think would be uh, advantages. There are also a lot of materials around. So I think that there are things that are already prepared for you, mm-hmm. which um, is an advantage for a lot of people, busy people, working people who are homeschooling. Um, I'm not, I've not done classical education. So those are just my takeaways that, of what I know and about it. What about the cons? What do you think about those? You know, people have been doing it. What do they say? Um, some of them, the amount of for some children isn't a good fit if they're not retaining the information from year to year. That was the one thing that I heard a friend of mine complaining about. They'd already studied something in depth, like ancient world. Mm-hmm. And when it came back around to cycle through that again, right. they were surprised. They just thought their children would know more. But they did have, they had been exposed to that information before, and it didn't take a lot to start talking about it again. And then you build on, oh, I remember we right. did this study or that study. It's good to point out that kids are not going to remember everything the first time that you teach it to them either. So That's true. don't think you're going to teach your kids something, you know, in second grade. And then when it comes back up again in sixth grade, they're going to be remembering it. They're not. And don't think that means you didn't do a good job. No, because you're learning how to learn. Right. And you're priming the pump for those things to stick the next time mm-hmm. around. And um, it's all it's all learning. It's all it good. Is. But but they may not be able to recite a poem that they learned at that right. time unless you keep reviewing it. And sure. so that's one of the things that a lot of those families do. The things you want in long-term memory, you make sure they get in there right. and you review them. The other thing I think about classical education, just from people I know who've done it, or people who um, will tell me, oh, you know, we school takes so long, like five hours, and my jaw just yeah, drops it's around. a long time. Um, yeah, so it, it can just take up a lot of time, and you just, maybe you don't have that much time for the volume of, of information you're supposed to be teaching right. your kid. You just kind of have to watch out for that. You can modify it. Right, yes. So then that leaves us with unschooling. So what would um, some of the pros be for unschooling? I think one of the big pros for unschooling is that you can tailor your learning lifestyle to your own family's interests. Mm -hmm. You can study things in great depth and breadth and study lots of different topics and follow. So it's very engaging. You've got your child motivated to learn something and you just hook on to that motivation off you go. So that's a major, a major pro. Mm -hmm. And most unschooling families that I know, they have a home that is filled with educational items. They have instruments and mm-hmm. books upon books upon books and microscopes. And I mean, their home is a learning laboratory. It's focused on learning. It's focused on learning. So um, some of the drawbacks of unschooling might be some of the things we talked about already with Charlotte Mason or unit study, where it may be hard to quantify exactly what your child has done. And there are ways around that, but it's really hard to put it on a piece of paper. Um, when the kids are studying something here and then they move on to something else. Um, True. So then good record keeping comes into play where you just, a lot of those families keep a log, Mm -hmm. maybe not a traditional checkoff type, uh, grade or record keeping but if you keep a log of those learning activities then you can track that you are actually learning things this is what we did today um, and then hit all those points. Hit, hit the points yeah well that was an overview of the various curriculum types slash uh, learning approaches and the pros and cons of each one mm-hmm. and you might be wondering how to choose so let's go ahead and get to our questions We have Franklin D. wrote in, I've been looking for curriculum and I'm starting to get overwhelmed. How do I choose? 
Yes, I've seen a lot of people asking about curriculum. And one of the things, I think one of the most very important things is that you really want to know a lot about yourself as a teacher. Exactly. And a lot about the way your kids learn. And in our previous episode, we talked about learning styles. So if you haven't heard that episode, you really want to listen to that if you're still in the middle of making your curriculum choices. Melody, how do learning styles affect your curriculum choices? For us, because I knew that my children, well, in the beginning, I had a very wiggly learner. So I needed to find something that already incorporated hands-on activities and um, movement and things to do not sitting at a table. Right. And with a pencil in his hand all the time. That was not going to work. And so for us, unit studies was a good solution for that. And then also I could incorporate other activities that would work for my sit down. You know, I have some who would like to sit down and fill out pages and pages of workbooks that would make their little heart so proud and so happy. And so I could incorporate those things for them. But if you are, if you are someone with really active children and you yourself are a more wiggly person, you might do better with something that's already meets that need that you have. Mm -hmm. You want to do hands-on things. On the other hand, If you have a child who doesn't feel like they're learning unless they're sitting down doing a paper or reading a book, that might not be as good of a fit for that kind of a learner. Our little perfect Pauls and Paulas, they Mm -hmm. really like to check off things and... My competent Carl. Oh, true. They would like that as well. So classical might be a good choice for that child. Mm -hmm. And we did dabble in some classical type things for him and he taught himself Latin. Which was a good thing. (laughs) Well, and there was a little unschooling thrown in there There then. There was some Mm -hmm. in there. But if you, you know, if you're a person who needs a more structured approach, so maybe you are that wiggly person, but you know that if you just fly in off in all directions, you're not going to get things done. Right. You might want to choose something that's more structured. Right. Structure does give you some freedom. Additionally, you want to consider what's going on in your own life. Are you a parent who can devote full time? to education or do you have to work from home or work outside of the home? Those also will drive your choice of curriculum because if you're really busy and you don't have prep time, you really might want to think about a traditional approach where Mm -hmm. it's pretty much open the book and go and you won't have to spend a lot of prep time. Your kids are going to get a great education and you're not going to be frazzled staying up till two in the morning preparing some kind of materials for the next day's lessons. Right. That's why I often recommend to new homeschoolers to pick something that's planned. My father's world, like sunlight, things that incorporate some of these approaches in them, but it's already planned out. You just right. pick it up, open it up to today, and do whatever's on the list. Exactly. So it's really important when you're choosing curriculum to think of certain factors. How do you live your life what Mm -hmm. time do you have to prepare what kind of kids are you teaching yes what kind of learners what kind of a learner are you obviously you don't want to um, only get materials that work for you because you want to teach your kids but it's got to be a good fit for everybody also a financial some of these curriculums oh my goodness my eyebrows almost blew (laughs) off when i saw somebody say four hundred dollars per grade level for some curriculum i thought my goodness I think that's about as much as I spent on one or two years of homeschool materials for five children. If you multiply it times children. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Right. And then you also want to think about what what do you want your homeschool to look like? Right. If you are more studious as a rule in your family, you're not going to be as happy with something that feels loosey-goosey. Sure. Like hands-on and crafts, and that's not going to be comfortable for you. Right. You would be happier with classical approach or a traditional approach. Yes, and even within those, they do have some hands-on projects and things they like sure that. Do. So. Don't be put off by the idea that it's more structured. It's right. still going to have art, you know, lessons and um, science experiments things and things like mm-hmm. that. Sure. But you just want to take those, all those factors into consideration. And then even after you do that, you might get a <laughs> curriculum that by December you hate. It's okay. That teaches you a lot. And you can still make that curriculum work or you can list it for sale and get something new to start off in January and just be aware that things change or you might not like something and it's okay if you hate it it's okay 
Does it happen to all of us at one time at or another? Some point, then you just pick something else. Pick something else or, or change what you have in some ways to make it work until you get to the end of the school year. So I, I think that these uh, guidelines will help people make their curriculum choices. And I think good so luck too. to you as you go through this new school year. That's right. If you have homeschooling questions, please send them to us on Twitter at underscore homeschool pod or email us at happyhomeschoolerpod at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Holly. I'm Melody. Happy, Happy homeschooling. homeschooling. Hi, this is your host, Holly williams Erbach. Thank you for listening to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a transcript maker production. My co-host is Melody Gillum. This episode was produced by Matthew Bass and edited by Nora Williams. Our graphic design is by Pete Soloway, and our music is by The Great Pangolin. You can find her music on YouTube and Twitter at Kylie Wins. That's K-A-I-L-E-Y Wins. If you'd like to help our podcast grow, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or as always, tell people about us. Well, there's a segue somewhere. <laughs> Oh, you're supposed to say if you have questions. Yeah, I was thinking uh, <laughs> I can say that. Uh, okay. I was like, is that our segue? I uh, guess we're done.